Beach in Ireland. She's cuddling Brendan. Donna is going off on an adventure. And David is having a meltdown. <laughs> but there she is, just smiling. A day at the beach in Ireland in 1953. My dad took this picture. And she had no idea that four years later, she would follow him across an ocean to start a new life. But on this day, she was just enjoying a day on the beach in Ireland. This story is about realizing whether it is fate or luck or divine intervention. Immigration made my life the wonderful life that it is. My father had a dream of a better life for his young family and he decided that America was the place to be. And so the plan was my mom would stay home in Ireland with my three brothers while my dad left for a job in Toronto. He was a skilled printer. So he got a job at the Toronto newspaper. My dad was a very proud Irishman. He didn't like Canada very much. It was uh, very British. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that he had to apply to get into the States under a British quota didn't sit well with him. And then there were all those pesky, no Irish need apply signs. It wasn't good. He couldn't wait to get to America. So he heard about a job at the Detroit Free Press, and he immediately went, uh, took a train from Toronto to Windsor and then a bus across the bridge to Detroit to check it out. And he loved it. He loved the Motor City and he applied for his visa right away. He then moved from Toronto to Windsor, got a job in the Windsor newspaper while he was waiting for all the papers to go through. And he would make regular trips on a bus across the bridge to visit Detroit. And he made friends, he ate new foods, and he discovered the Gaelic League and the Irish American Club. And he found his way in a country where he knew no one. So once all the papers were in order, he sent away, he sent for my mom. And so my mom, on her own in Ireland, had to pack up their house, sell what they weren't gonna ship over to the States, and sell their beautiful little home in Dublin and say goodbye to her father. She, uh, she was just so brave to do all of this on her own. Then she had to get in a propeller plane with those three and fly across the ocean to Detroit. And she used to tell me all the time, it was the longest flight of my life, <laughs> you can imagine. But it was hard on my brothers too. They were little and they had to leave their friends and their home and their granda. And in Ireland, they had gotten a new TV, a TV, and it was a really big deal. And their favorite shows were the American Westerns, especially Gunsmoke. So when the day came for them to come to Detroit, my dad, he was excited. He had procured a rental house in Lincoln Park, which was on the bus line so he could get to work at the Free Press because he didn't have a car. He had also gotten a taxi to wait for them at the airport so he could take them to the new house. And the story is that my brothers were so excited about being in America that as they were in the taxi, the whole way down 94, they had their noses pressed against the window and just kept asking, where are the cowboys? Where are the cowboys? <laughs> now to my knowledge, the only cowboy that has ever been on 94 was the Marlboro Man billboard, and that was years later. But my dad was, he was so in love with America and he wanted to show the best of America to them. He had told them about pizza but they had never seen it. So the first week that they're in this country, my dad brings home a large deluxe Clementi's pizza and puts it on the table. And as he tears open the brown square paper bag that holds this treat, 
My brothers are staring at it silently. And then Brendan cries out, it looks like somebody threw up on bread. <laughs> My dad pretty much ate that whole first pizza, but within a month they were eating pizza and learning about baseball and watching Saturday morning cartoons. My brothers lost their accents. My brother Donna became Don at school. They just wanted to fit in. Now I was the first one born in America, so today I would be an anchor baby. <laughs> And our family grew. Um, my younger brother was born in December of 1963, exactly one month after President Kennedy was assassinated. They named him John Fitzgerald Kelly, JFK. I remember in 1968, my parents became naturalized citizens. And I remember how they were so worried and stressed about studying for the big test. The following year, my eldest brother, David, left to serve in Vietnam, and he survived. My immigrant parents were proud American citizens. They never missed an election. My mom became one of those voter ladies, you know, the election poll ladies, and she carried her, her proof, her election uh, voter's registration card with her wherever she went. She never learned how to drive, but she learned how to vote. I had no problems with my identity. I was very proud of my Irishness. I took Irish dancing lessons. I learned a little bit of Gaelic. And I went with my parents to events at the Irish American Club. And in fact, I was crowned the Maid of Erin for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> One day, um, a guy I was dating met my father for the first time. And uh, as he was chatting with him, he mentioned that uh, he drove an MG. And thinking this would impress my father, threw in the tidbit that, you know, the car is made in Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> my father took a drag from his Pall Mall. I fail to see the greatness. <laughs> <laughs> it was awkward. <laughs> but there were hard times. When I was 13, I contracted a very serious infection from a doctor's office visit. I ended up in the hospital for six weeks. I had four surgeries. I nearly had a colostomy. I nearly had a hysterectomy. I nearly died when I was 13 years old. It was horrible for my parents. I remember waking up in the hospital one day and just feeling good for no apparent reason. And I overheard the doctor saying, the funny thing is, we don't know what cured her. I didn't care. I had no idea the impact that that episode would have on the rest of my life. So I went back to school, went on to graduate from college, and I married the guy with the MG. <laughs> my dad had forgiven him. And you know, I think they loved him more than they loved me, and they loved me a lot. <laughs> But Jim and I, we, uh, we were together for a long time and we decided that we wanted to have a family. And then we learned a devastating new word, infertility, the result of my illness when I was 13. We were on the infertility roller coaster for several years until we finally asked ourselves the big question. What was our goal? Was it to achieve pregnancy? Or was it to have a family? We never looked back, and we just moved forward. Our first call was to a local adoption agency. And again, divine intervention, who knows? But the woman on the other end of the phone informed me that due to Jim's advanced age, he was 35, <laughs> that the wait for infants was so long, by the time we got to the top of the list, he would be too old. We accepted this as truth. And this wrong answer, because it wasn't true, but this wrong answer is what led us to call about international adoption. And that is how, in 1988, our son, Daniel James, arrived from Seoul, South Korea. A couple of years later, our daughter, Chloe Kelly, showed up. 
And finally, our family was complete with Evan Thomas a couple of years later. Who knew that the children that we were meant to have would be born to three different women on the other side of the world? A couple of years later, we went on a family vacation with my mom to Ireland. And this picture was taken on the same beach that she was with my, one with my brothers some 40 years earlier. Khalil Gibran wrote, your children are not your children. They come through you, not from you. We've learned many, many things over the years. And one of the biggest lessons is that whether you give birth to children or adopt them, there are no guarantees. Both of our boys have cognitive impairments. And Evan arrived with a, a pretty big cleft lip and palate and a lot of medical issues. And he's had a lot of surgeries and he still has more to come. Our family loves our children. They're our kids. When my mom used to babysit Daniel when he was very small, she saw how excited he got every uh, week when the garbage trucks came through the neighborhood. So, as one does, she buckled him in the stroller, and early every Wednesday morning, out the door they would go to follow the garbage trucks around the neighborhood so he could watch <coughs> up close. That's love. When Daniel was nearly two, we took him to Ireland with my parents, and we stayed in a house in Glasnevin that was just a few doors down from where they used to live. And I remember deciding to go shopping one day in the city on my own with Daniel on a bus. So I had him on my lap and I'm sitting there and this woman looked at me and she asked me directions somewhere. And I thought, oh, I'm so flattered. She doesn't think I'm a tourist. <laughs> she thinks I'm a local. <laughs> I thought it was so cool. But then I realized if my parents hadn't had the courage to emigrate, I would have been a local. I probably would have been sitting on that same bus, going on that same route to go shopping. But I would not have had that gorgeous little boy on my lap. My children are all immigrants, naturalized citizens of the United States, as are my parents and my brothers. But my parents had a huge advantage. They were white, they spoke English, and their accents were considered charming rather than foreign. You know, when we were waiting for our kids, the, most, the only tangible thing that we had to hold on to were the precious photographs that were sent to us by the adoption agency. And I made photos copies of the pictures and shared them with my family. And I remember when we went to the airport the day we got the call that Daniel would be arriving, our first child. He was four months old. We, Jim and I were so excited, it was almost unbearable, and we got to the airport hours earlier than we had to. And we sat there waiting, and we saw the parade of our family and friends coming to greet this new member of the clan. And I saw my mom walking down the concourse, and she had something on her shirt, which I hoped was intentional. And <laughs> you never know. <laughs> and as I got up close, I saw that it was the picture of the baby. She had cut it into a circle and pinned it to her shirt. And I looked at her and I said, Mom. And she said very proudly, I want to be sure that Daniel knows who his Nana is. <laughs> and to me, it was full circle. It was the immigrant welcoming the new immigrant to a better life. And you know, our country was built and is just, it, our country is what it is because of the immigrants that have come here. And I hope that we never ever forget that. Thank you.